Hello and welcome to the Sexy and Being Sessions. Today we're here to talk about holistic relationships. So holistic relationships are something I came across as I started to explore the relationships and love more deeply. And we're going to start diving into those. If you found that you're stuck in patterns of potential codependency or where your relationships just aren't working or you're getting out of relationships and it feels just like this ripping away of a part of yourself, then you've come to the right place. I'm Alex Pruitt, a certified sex, love, and relationship coach with a BDSM and kink focus. I work with men, women, and couples plus who want to transform their old patterns, pain, and beliefs so they can create thriving relationships that are deeply connected, playful, and fulfilling within themselves and with others. So how we came to this place of talking about holistic relationships and why I find it so important is I had a model of relationships myself for a very long time that made codependency incredibly normal. And I did a quick search right before this call to kind of brush myself up on what are some of these like signs that you may be falling into codependent patterns. One of the top ones is people pleasing. So that's saying yes to an experience or something to avoid a conflict, right? To have the other person be happy because if they're happy, then you're going to be happy. It's a lack of personal boundaries. So you are an individual, you have your own boundaries. Your boundaries are a way to differentiate yourself from what you want to experience and what you don't want to experience. When we have a lack of boundaries, again, it can be that, let's say you have a partner and they cross one of these boundaries. Well, you go and you speak up to them and you're like, hey, I really didn't like this. It hurt when you took this action, right? My feelings felt hurt. I felt really sad. I felt really mad, whatever that was. And they acknowledge it. Maybe they even apologize. And then they keep doing that action over and over and over again. And you don't ever really take an action for yourself when these boundaries are crossed, right? That was one of my bad things. I actually could speak up to some degree about when my boundaries were crossed with things I wasn't okay with. And I never actually took an action for myself when these things continued. Another one can be poor self-esteem. So if you have a lot of self-hate, things around your body image can be incredibly normal in this space. Um, needing, you know, like you only feel sexy when you have a partner telling you you're sexy or outside people telling you you're sexy. Um, you need other people to validate what you are, who you are for you to believe it is true. And if somebody starts telling you negative things about who you are, you just accept that as truth and will use it as a way to also beat yourself up. Those are great examples from my personal experience and working with clients of what poor self-esteem can look like. Caretaking. This is where you're trying to take care of all the other people in your life all the time. And this, this becomes especially toxic in your own system when you're not caring for yourself first. So one of my biggest mantras around being a caretaker for other people was that it was okay to put my own oxygen mask on first. And when I started doing this, it felt really difficult. I had people who also didn't like this because I had just been doing for them and inadvertently burning myself out. Like I could only give so much. And when my bucket was empty, so to speak, I didn't have more to give and they were getting frustrated that I couldn't give more. And ultimately this led to different forms of burnout within my life when I was trying to caretake all these other people. And ultimately it took the focus off of actually allowing myself to see what my own needs were and apply that care back to me. Um, let's see, poor communication. You're not able to talk about your feelings. If you feel hurt or upset, even like joyful about something, maybe you're not great at letting your partner know what those things are. 
a lack of self-image, a loss of identity, if you don't have the relationship, a dependency where you feel like you need this other person to be okay. It takes away from your solidarity, your anonymity, your own power is being given over to another person when you're taking on this role. Another one is reactivity. So in a lot of instances, you don't feel like you're making a choice when something comes up. It's just a kind of automatic response. Or if you feel hurt, it's more of an explosion of emotion rather than you getting to notice the emotion coming up. And then relationship stress, right? This can be high conflicts, constantly worrying that you're going to lose your partner in some way that you can't communicate or get the respect you need for your boundaries. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of different things that fall into this, but we're just doing a brief overview of what some of those big flags can be that you're falling into codependency with relationships. Now, I want to make it clear that it's, it's very normal and it's been very normalized to fall into highly codependent relationships within our society. And so if you're recognizing any of these traits in yourself, like I just want to give you the invitation to offer yourself some compassion, some kindness. Like you can imagine yourself being a little kid and falling into any of these categories. Like this is what was shown to you as the way to be in the world, how you stayed safe, how you survived. So be kind with yourself in these respects and know that as this adult version of you, you can learn different skills, you can make different choices for your life moving forward. So you can have these spaces that I consider more holistic relationships. Now let's get a bit into what I see as being holistic relationships. A holistic relationship is more of the space of having two separate individuals, two whole beings coming together. And when they come together, they're able to share those spaces, share the experiences with one another. And then when it's time for them to separate, they can move away from that space and maybe they come back together again. And then they get to share those spaces, right? They get to share about what their experiences have been since they last got to adventure together in life. But it's not this huge tearing away. It's not a loss of self when this other person steps away. A lot of the way highly codependent relationships are kind of set up as like that broader background picture is this idea that like you're one half of a person until you come together with another person. And then when you come together, you're making a whole. The idea with holistic relationships is you have two whole people that are then coming together to create a beautiful experience. The relationship can be seen as its own entity, but each of those people still have their identities. They have their boundaries. They're able to communicate. They're able to express when something doesn't feel okay for them and have it be accepted and understood, even loved by the other person. They're willing to again, speak up because communication is going to be the top way to let others know that something is not right for you or not working for you. There's feedback. You can do check-ins with a partner. You're not falling into people pleasing. Like you're not taking on a different identity so that this person wants to be with you or likes you. They like you and love you for who you are because you show up in your standard, in your being. And I do want to say, like, as I'm speaking through this, there was probably so much of me, let's say six, seven years ago, when I was in incredibly codependent relationships, where it thought that sort of connection is a fantasy. <laughs> and it's not actually possible to have that. I want to tell you, it is possible to have that. And there's ways to start validating that 
for yourself within your lived experience right now so that you can start bringing it forward, especially in romantic partnerships. So you can, you can experience codependency in any type of relationship. I would say the number one area where that codependency like is actually needed is when you have a very young child. And when I'm saying very young child, I mean zero to five years old. As a parent, it is something I've gotten to experience and it's been a part of my own growth journey to realize where there's value in doing those things and where there's not, where it becomes this thing that is out of balance for my life and my relationships overall. Well, when you have a baby, and especially a newborn baby, you have this being that for the first year of its life is 100% dependent on you for all of its needs. And then as it grows, and as this child ages, it's this very slow process of the child gaining a little bit more of its independence each step of the way. And as the parent, you being willing to let go. So like as a child moves into being a toddler, let's say, they'll start walking and exploring slightly further distances and further distances away from the parent. But at each of these kind of like edges of, of where they feel safe going, they'll actually turn around and look back to see if the parent is there, is bringing them presence, is bringing them focus, because that helps them see, oh, I'm safe, right? It also gives the parent the opportunity to say like, nope, come back. That's a little bit too far because maybe the kid didn't realize like, the road is not safe to go near, right? It's, it's helping the young child start to explore the world. Now, what can end up happening, and it can happen in many different instances, is maybe we didn't receive that type of nurturing when we were young. So we had a hugely excessive amount of independence, and we want to feel that safety, that comes from that sort of connection with another person, right? Or maybe we had that and it was too restrictive. We weren't actually allowed to gain our independence, step into our power, step into our anonymity and have that supported, again, accepted, understood and loved. So we don't actually feel safe stepping out into that. Again, we can then bring it back into our relationships. And so the premise of this is not that like you are not a whole being already. You very much so are. It's stepping away from these ingrained beliefs that we pick up again through our own experiences, through what's modeled in our families, what's modeled in society, in the media, in our religions, and starting to break the mold and see that like you, you are are a whole person. There may be parts of you that have been wounded, have been broken over time. And you as this whole person can work towards healing those wounds and then come together with another person in relationship to again, share these spaces. Now, I can't remember the name of the website. I will try to look it up and add a link down in the description section. There is an amazing resource I came across um, a handful of years ago. I was researching attachment theory, which if you don't know much about and you're noticing that you fall into codependent relationships, I really recommend checking it out. It talks about this idea of anxious attachment which is when somebody starts to move away, pull away, it kind of sends off blaring alarms in your system that say, this isn't safe. And this person tends to be the, the chaser who feels like they need to like run down the other person to bring them back. There is dismissive or avoidant 
attachment styles. And those tend to be the ones where closeness with other people can actually feel incredibly unsafe. And even though they care about the other person and want those connections in relationship, there's a part of them that pulls back and says, I, I can't go there. Um, and so they'll tend to shut off. If there's a conflict, they'll just walk away or avoid the conflict altogether. And again, these are just very broad overviews. Attachment theory is a very in-depth and detailed um, analysis that has been happening, I believe, for well over a decade now. So if it's piquing your interest, go look into it. The last main category is called secure attachment, and that's where it's that balance between the avoidant and anxious attachment. It's that you can be by yourself and be okay, and you can be in connection with other people and be okay, have your boundaries, like have your power and still be in power with somebody else and have it be be uh, aligned, we'll call it. But there is this phenomenal quiz or online quiz I came across and it actually asks you to look at like your dynamic with your mother and your father, I believe a sibling, a friend, and then romantic partners. And it plots based on these different relationships you've had, what falls into more avoidant, what falls into more anxious attachment, what falls into more secure attachment points. And what I found really interesting for myself in this analysis was I could see that in certain relationship styles, I was more avoidant in the connection. In other ones, I was more anxious. And in other ones still, I was actually securely attached. And for me, I was securely attached and felt the safest in my friendships. And for me, when I'm in that space of feeling securely attached, again, like I can have, I can have a, somebody who I consider a really good friend and they kind of like step out of my life for a little bit because they have their own stuff going on. Maybe they need to travel. Maybe they have a new partner. Maybe they just have high stress at work and they just need some space for themselves. But they can step out. I don't feel incredibly hurt that they need to take a step away for whatever reason. Like my hope is that if they actually have a problem with me, that they will speak up about it and communicate with me about it. And it's also not my job to mind read that they have a problem. They have their own power, their own autonomy to come to me if there is an issue and have a conversation about it so we can find a different understanding together. Well, and in that, like, I'm that whole person. Like, I don't need them. They don't have to be there for me to be okay, right? They can step away. We can come back together. And again, my friendships were the greatest reflection of this. Like we could have times where every single day for a whole month or months on end, we're in constant communication and then something happens and like communication slacks off a little bit and they, they kind of blip out. I go on to do other things. They go on to do other things and we come back again, at some later point that works well for both of us. And then we get to share those spaces again. It doesn't mean that I can't reach out to them in between. It also means that like, I'm not really hurt or taking offense to it if they don't respond to me within a certain amount of time, right? It means that like, I can be happy for them in going and having whatever adventures they're having. If I have agreements with them that like one, Hopefully they stick to their agreements or two, if they can't stick to their agreements, we're able to have conversations and kind of realign to then work together in the future for agreements that work for both of us, right? So let's say I have this really great friend and we're talking every day for a month because that's the example I used before. Well, I have some huge work project come up and 
now I'm not able to like sit on the phone with them for an hour, like catching up, talking about life philosophy or whatever it is, because more of my attention and focus is needing to go to my work. And let's say this project has a timeline of a couple months. Cool. Like I can communicate that to them. Like, Hey, I'm actually going to need more space. Like I love our conversations and I need to bring my focus here in that space of a more holistic relationship. They're able to take that with grace and be like, yeah, go do your thing. Like, go catch up with you when, when the time is right. And so many people I've noticed have a hard time with that, even in friendships, but it's, it's that concept that I want to invite you all to step into within your relationships. And this doesn't just have to be with friends, right? You can bring these same concepts into your partnered relationships. You can bring these same concepts into your family relationships. And again, especially family relationships or relationships that have a long standing, especially if they were built in highly codependent spaces, those people there may not like that shift because they're used to receiving from you in a certain way. They're used to you showing up in a very specific way that meets their needs or wants on some level. And now you're shifting and transitioning into a new way of being within your relationships. And this can be painful especially like when these people have said that they want to support you and love you. Right. And at the same time, it can also give you this really beautiful lens of the relationships that may not actually be serving you may not actually be adding value to your life. And I don't mean that like the relationship is adding value to your life and it takes away from someone else. I mean that like when you're in that relationship together, it adds value to both of your experiences. Again, you are two whole people and the relationship is this own entity where you come together in agreements that work mutually for you to have it. And if you can't come to those agreements, again, maybe it's just not the right relationship. And I guess that's another piece that I found falls highly into like my own codependent patterns. If something was wrong within the relationship, I was really good at having it mean there was something wrong with me, right? This also went the opposite direction. So let's say, um, actually, I had the experience of having a handful of partners where they ended up cheating on me at some point in time, or leaving me for another person. And this felt incredibly painful. And I will acknowledge that there are things that I could have been doing differently in the relationship earlier on to avoid getting to the extent that a partner needed to cheat on me. And even though those things happened, it didn't warrant my partner ever lying to me or breaking their own agreements in the relationship either. Right. So it's, I have my partner obviously because I am part of that relationship and it also doesn't mean that I deserved to be cheated on or lied to by a partner because my part, they also had, their own part that's if there's a conflict if there's disagreements if the agreements aren't working within the relationship it never actually just falls to one person um like what I what I realize now like I was very very weak in my own boundaries I've had ex-partners who were blatantly stealing from me like I couldn't keep cash in my wallet or in my house, because if I did, it would be gone. 
I had to hide my credit cards because even though I was having conversations with this partner about, hey, like, I'm really not okay with this. Like, if you ask to borrow money, cool. Like, most of the time that won't bother me. You just taking it without asking, like, I'm, I'm not okay with that. But it was a pattern that kept repeating. Again, as I mentioned towards the beginning of this session, I would speak those things. And then when it would continue happening, I didn't actually take action for it. Like, I guess my, my action in those moments was I eventually didn't leave cash in my house, didn't carry cash on my person, and I hid my credit cards. But ultimately, that wasn't really a healthy relationship for me to be in over the course of time. Like, there, were, there was cheating and lying in many other areas as well, not just that. And I'd kind of do, like, the minimum to keep myself safe so that person stayed there and that that was my codependency um one of the things I also found incredibly interesting like now looking back in hindsight is when one of my partners was actually going through uh, addiction treatment programs the facility ended up giving me a book called Codependent No More. And I remember it being fascinating because it was the f- probably the first self-help book I ever read. I had actually been, had a fairly high aversion to self-help and counseling based on some bad experiences in my past. So when I actually read through this thing, there was the part of me self-reflecting being like, oh yeah, I can see myself in like, this part of what they're saying or that part of what they're saying, but I don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, I did that in this relationship in the past, but I don't do that anymore. And it was fascinating because so much of it for me came back to having very weak boundaries (laughs) for myself into the people pleasing, into avoiding conflict, um, all these different areas that like literally that list we went through at the beginning covers right and like looking back it's it took me a while to realize where those things were really coming through and that also took me coming to a place of more holistic integration in my own body and mind, again, coming to more of this place of wholeness within myself and then bringing that to the relationships outside of me. So that idea of being a caretaker for others, right? I was giving, 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 making sure other people's needs are met, making sure that not only did they have like the essentials of like shelter, clothing, food, water, right? oxygen to breathe that they also got all the emotional support and with sexual relationships that I was doing everything to make sure they were sexually satisfied even if I wasn't (laughs) um it it fell into a lot of different categories especially in romantic relationships for me and again maybe your romantic relationships are on point for whatever reason when it comes to those connections and your friendships are shit when it comes to holistic relationships or your family relationships. My guess is if you're still here, you're having some reflections that say, no, like, hang out, listen, there's something here for you. And I can guarantee there is. There's probably some value point you will take away for yourself. And again, that's why I offer these spaces. So when we're stepping out of this idea of codependent relationships and into holistic relationships, again, it comes down to the idea of two individuals coming together and then the relationship itself is its own entity, but you still have the two individuals. So one of the most valuable things I've found, and it doesn't matter if it's been with dating or with longer term partnerships is making sure that I'm bringing that caretaking to myself. 
that like I am always going to be my own best lover, my own best dom because I'm in the kink and BDSM community and I identify as a sub. Um, my own best partner, right? And working on that relationship within myself because the more I help fulfill those needs, understand those needs, accept those needs and wants and desires, then the less pressure it kind of puts on the world that it needs to fulfill it for me. So let's say I go into a relationship and I have a really terrible self-esteem and this partner, the imaginary partner will every once in a while, like tell me how beautiful I am or how sexy I am on a whole nother note. They will like be really critical, maybe even body shame me around being fat or not being good enough sexually or these other things. And because on some level, I'm getting like the positive feedback of this person finds me sexy. Oh, I need to change these things they find unsexy or unattractive. Like I'm staying around because I'm getting those breadcrumbs of validation for my system that I'm attractive enough. I'm worthy enough. I'm, I'm enough to have a partner. And ultimately, that led to a lot of losing myself. So the caretaking of self comes back to self-care. It comes back to self-love, self-acceptance, self-understanding. And again, the more I bring myself those, the less I actually need that from anyone else in the world. So one of my favorite practices for this, and it's so simple, but I will probably continue to recommend it to people until the day I die. I find it very unlikely that I will ever tell people to not do this, but who knows, um, is a simple mirror practice. And literally, like, especially if you've had self-esteem issues, like, and especially around physical appearance, and I know that is really, really common for so many people, is any time you look in the mirror, one, start to notice what thoughts come up. Like, is do you have a visceral reaction? Like, I can say in my own experience, I used to have a visceral reaction to seeing my reflection where I felt disgusted, right? And that there's a lot in that. I also have suffered from body dysmorphia for a huge chunk of my life. But notice notice the thoughts that are coming up about like how you look. Those could also be positive thoughts. Like I'm not saying they can't. I'm just saying like in my experience, especially when I was in very low self-esteem and needing high validation from the outside world, those were typically very negative towards myself. Um, The next piece is make a conscious choice to focus on something you love. And this invitation is to find any little thing that you can genuinely love and appreciate about your body. Now, when I found this practice, it was actually within a year or two of me having my son. And Oddly enough, one of my biggest areas that I hated for most of my life on my body, and again, this has been since I was a little, little kid, was my stomach. I had a huge disdain for it. Like, I didn't like the look of it. I didn't like the feel of it. Like, it just felt fat all the time, even when it wasn't fat. Um, But in this, I, like, I would actually avoid even looking at my stomach. So during one of these practices, I looked at my stomach in the mirror and let myself notice what negative things were coming up and then focused on words of appreciation for what I loved and appreciated about my stomach, what I was grateful for with my stomach. And at that point, because I had 
been pregnant with my son, I was able to appreciate my stomach and that area of my body for having carried my son, for having grown this life inside me and like allowed my body to shift and morph to accommodate growing a whole nother human being in there, to appreciate the stretch marks that were there on my body to, to even love them. Right. And I was able to genuinely step into gratitude for my stomach helping facilitate that space. Now you can find lots of different reasons. Like if you're, you're a male, you're probably not going to have the experience of carrying a baby and your stomach, your belly does a ton of work to serve you that you don't even think about. Think about your digestive processes that happen in that area. Um, If you are overweight, right? You're carrying extra weight in your stomach. Like how is that there to serve you, right? Because I can guarantee in some way, even if you hate it being there, It's there to serve you. One thing I personally found was my body will actually put on an extra like, we'll call it coating, but like there'll be extra extra density in my fat layer on my body when I'm not happy in relationships or when I'm experiencing certain like very consistent low levels of stress in my system. And it's part of me trying to say, hey, there's something not right here. Like, look at me, right? So there there can be a lot of different things that you can bring that appreciation and focus to. But this invitation is to do that. Start bringing yourself love in those instances you know how to care for you best because you know what the experiences are like to feel and be within your body. You are the only person who is with you from the moment you are born until the day you die. So why why not show yourself that same love that you're wanting to show a partner so that you can receive it from a partner. Be your own best partner first. Show up in those ways for yourself because then it's going to make it easier when you find other relationships to know which ones are going to be like in that space of holistic relationships versus just highly codependent. You'll be able to recognize when other people aren't able to respect your boundaries and realize this just isn't the right relationship for me and let it go versus, again, it being this huge indiscretion where they fucked you over and they're just an asshole or I'm a piece of shit and I'm worthless and like I'm not sexy, whatever those narratives are. (laughs) That's what I was mentioning earlier. Like I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I had a handful of relationships where I was the person who broke up with the other person. And in those, it was really easy to just be like, well, they were an asshole, right? They cheated or they were abusive in these ways or whatever else. And it doesn't mean that they didn't do those things, but why did I stay for as long as I did? Because there was a choice in that. It was not a conscious choice. It was more of a reaction based on the conditioning that I had had over like what was appropriate for the way I showed up to relationships. I also didn't have a lot of clarity over what it was I needed or wanted in relationships or in a partner. So that right there can be a really, really huge key. Again, Another one of my favorite practices, like getting, getting clarity in general about what it is that you actually want is huge. And it is in the coaching world, one of the 
biggest keys. Because if you don't know what you want, what you need, then when you get it, how do you know you actually have it? Besides, like, now you feel whole or fulfilled or satiated, like, then you're just leaving it off a failing and you're kind of, like, poking around in the dark trying trying to find this thing that feels right like you you can actually have more of an active role in creating the spaces that feel right feel fulfilling rather than again just poking around in the dark trying to figure it out actually one of the ways I used to describe my self-love journey for a really long time was that it was like me being alone in a dark cave and kind of like padding my ways along the walls, trying to to find where I was supposed to go. And again, there was a, a later epiphany hindsight being that 2020 where I was using this analogy and I was like, I was actually talking about my own coaching and I was like, yeah, and I'm the person like, like I don't know this other person's path, but I've been on similar paths. I've been in similar caves and I can hold this torch to help them see what's there, right? To help them gain that clarity. And it was great because at that point in time, I went, oh, I wasn't alone in my cave. I just had my eyes shut because I had a counselor. I had friends, I had family members and all these other people who were supporting me as well. And I just wasn't seeing it, right? That so much of my own journey has been having to come back into my own anonymity, my own self and being in that power. And what allowed me to feel in that power was this idea that I was in the darkness alone in a cave, right? No help whatsoever no flashlights whatsoever. So again, know that you're not alone in it ever. Like if you have experienced something, there is probably somebody else in the world or the existence of time who has experienced something that's at least fairly similar, right? Or something worse or something way better. Like it's just how our existence kind of tends to work. And so much of the time we can feel very, very alone in it all. Um, I guess one invitation out of that feeling of alone is to, to explore that feeling of alone. I know when I was consistently in very codependent relationships, I had a huge fear of being alone. And so I would settle for breadcrumbs. I would leave myself in what were very toxic and very abusive relationship spaces because I was so scared of being alone. The kind of ironic thing was that when I had those spaces of feeling alone, like I was single and all those things, I was usually... The most happy because I actually felt I could be myself and over time and as I started gaining an awareness of it I realized that as I would be in relationships with other people I would start sort of like shifting and muting myself out in certain areas of interaction with them because they were things that I, they'd either stated were ideals, preferences, or judgments for them, or I perceived that they didn't like. And so, again, very subconscious layer of my being thought, like, I need to shift that or change that about myself so that this person will stay, so that I'm not alone. And so if you, if you notice that fear of being alone, like, I do, I do recommend like doing the shadow work around that. And if you notice that you're in that space of very codependent relationships, 
it can be so valuable to find help around this because if you're in that very outward focused space, which is, it tends to be when you are in very codependent relationships, then it can be really hard to actually reflect back and see what's actually there for you without it being incredibly critical or shame associated and having having somebody who is trained to hold that space for you can be really helpful so like a a coach who works with relationship or relationship dynamics who has gone through their own empowerment process around holistic healing in ways right and around relationships can be immensely helpful in holding this container of safety, holding this container of love for your journey forward and helping show you those things in very compassionate ways to best serve you. Um, One thing I will recommend if you do decide to hire somebody outside yourself is we can end up inadvertently being drawn to people or feeling a connection with people that are a strong reflection of codependent relationships because on some level our subconscious system got the impression that like no this equals safety like I need to go back to this it feels familiar it feels safe right it's you learn to have very toxic relationships and consider them safe very toxic relationships like on some level can feel comfortable because we're used to them and very healthy relationships can honestly feel kind of uncomfortable at times because it's almost like being in a world of the unknown because you haven't really let yourself have those spaces. But what you can take away is like, Go with a coach, go with a therapist, like who wants you to be in your power, right? Who who helps you explore and it's it's not based on like the therapist is better than me or the coach is better than me. Like they are there to get, or in my opinion, get curious as fuck about what your experiences have been, ask great questions so like you can navigate that proverbial cave versus them telling you that like you did something wrong or it was bad or anything along those lines, because then you're just getting into those spaces where you'll probably end up again, morphing yourself to fit whatever their ideal is rather than being empowered in yourself. On that note, I'm going to wrap things up for today. I want to invite you to reflect down in the comments like what was your biggest takeaway like what resonated for you the most or felt like an aha moment from this session today if you're interested in working with me you can find a link below under the resources link um, or in the about section on youtube again i will try to track down that quiz for the different attachment styles because it is a really, really good one and probably my favorite one I've come across. And I definitely recommend checking it out, especially if attachment theory like kind of resonated for you and sounded like something that may be coming up. Other than that, I will see everyone next time. And I'm so excited for next time because we're going to be talking about BDSM archetypes. So until then, have a fantastic week.